podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for an excellent meeting so far. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I, I'm very glad to, uh, to get to spend this time in Munich. So I'm going to be talking today about a series of papers uh, that have come out over the last year uh, with two groups of collaborators. Uh, this is work that was done in collaboration with James Gray uh, here at LMU in Munich, Andre Lucas at the University of Oxford, and Iran Palti at the Ecole Polytechnique, um, as well as a separate series of works uh, also with James and Andre and with Bert Overt at the University of Pennsylvania. So to begin, I'd just like to give a little bit of motivation uh, for what I'm about to tell you about today. Uh, we heard in the first talk of this conference that uh, in many respects we can view string theory as a powerful extension of quantum field theory. Uh, we have many different applications that we might want to consider, uh, but it's an unfortunate or, or perhaps fortunate fact that writing down the effective theories from string theory uh, in most cases are much more difficult than writing down a quantum field theory. Uh, we understand the rules much better for quantum field theory for how we design a theory uh, of our choice, whereas in string compactifications in particular, we begin with some theory that lives in higher dimensions. We have to reduce on some compact geometry and end up with some 4D theory. Now, what would be really nice is, from a 4D perspective, if you want to engineer a particular effective theory, for example, if you want to engineer something like the standard model, uh, you would like a toolkit which tells you which string geometries can give you the physics of interest. Uh, you're missing a lot of tools uh, in this goal at the moment. Uh, so, for example, in many corners of the string landscape, you're missing uh, features of some n equals 1 supersymmetric Lagrangian couplings. Uh, you have issues with moduli. And you also don't understand really the rules for how you select these geometries. So it would be good to have a better understanding of the patterns, constraints, uh, and predictions sort of from a top-down point of view uh, that would give you interesting 4D physics in the arena of your choice. So the goal of, of what I'm going to be talking about today is not, uh, at no point am I going to be focusing on a single string compactification or a single specific geometry, but rather what are the general techniques uh, that you can do on a very large scale, for example, uh, over billions uh, of different compactifications. Can you understand what the rules are, uh, how you produce models of interest, and identify, hopefully, patterns that are of use to you? So with that in hand, uh, the arena for what I'm going to talk about today will be the smooth E8 cross E8 heterotic string in 10 dimensions. Uh, just to give a bit of, of geometric background, the ingredients that I have to put into this theory in order to produce uh, some 40 effective theory uh, I have to reduce my uh, Yang-Mills coupled to gravity theory in 10 dimensions down to some Yang-Mills theory uh, supergravity in four dimensions. And to do that, I need to get rid of six dimensions. I'm going to do that in the form of a compact Calabial threefold. And in addition, I'd like to break the E8 symmetry uh, that I have in 10 dimensions down to something smaller by introducing gauge field bevs in the hidden dimensions. And that's going to geometrically take the form of two holomorphic vector bundles one of which I'm going to use to build uh, the visible effective theory in four-dimensional Minkowski space, and another which can serve as a hidden sector, uh, which is coupled only gravitationally. I hope uh, that I can choose a geometry which will preserve n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions, at least at the level of the compactification. Uh, and while the, the vector bundle is going to break uh, E8 into some direct product, I'm initially going to end up with some grand unified uh, group in four dimensions, and that symmetry will be the commutant of the structure group of a given bundle inside E8. So for example, if I choose gauge field bevs to form an SUN bundle over the Calabial manifold, uh, where n is 2, 3, 4, or 5, I can end up with an E7, E6, SO10, or SU5 theory. Uh, as is familiar to many people, when I want to write down the features of that four-dimensional theory, from this point on, everything will be determined by the geometry that I started with. So for example, uh, decomposing the 248 adjoint representation of E8, uh, under a direct product, say I chose an SU5 bundle, I would have SU5 times SU5 decomposition, uh, and I can in fact count the number of matter fields that appear in my 4D theory, for example, the number of 10s, 10 bars, and 5s, by certain quasi-topological numbers over the Calabial three threefold. So having chosen this compact geometry, a vector bundle and a Calabial, I am no longer free to tune the number of fields uh, or couplings in my theory. These are fully specified by this geometric data. So these are bundle-valued cohomology groups over the Calabial. And in addition to the SU5 charge matter in this example, I would also have singlets uh, in the 4D uh, theory. These are, would be moduli that have the familiar geometric origin of the Kähler and complex structure moduli of the Calabial, as well as certain integration constants 
coming from the connection on my holomorphic bundle V. Uh, so these would be bundle moduli as well as, of course, dilaton and possibly M5 brain moduli. So what I'm going to, uh, to be discussing today uh, was introduced very nicely by Angel this morning. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two strings of work, both with this idea towards better controlling and developing an effective theory for a large class of, of geometries. Uh, and both of these ideas are going to be focused on the fact that I am using vector bundles uh, to describe gauge fields over the Calabi manifold. And I'm going to be explicitly using the conditions for n equals 1 supersymmetry. Uh, geometrically, these appear as something called the Hermitian Yang Mills equations, which are non trivial conditions relating the field string of my vector bundles uh, in each E8 uh, to, in this case, the Calabi L, the 1 1 part of the Calabi L metric. Uh, and I have to satisfy this non-trivial set of PDEs in order to have an n equals 1 vacuum. So what I'm going to discuss today will have two parts. Uh, the first part will be briefer than the second. Uh, I'm going to describe ways to produce effective theories uh, that have spectra like the standard model. Specifically, I'm going to be interested in ways to tune a heterotic geometry to produce exact MSSM spectrum with no charged exotics, uh, chiral or otherwise. And the basic idea that I'm going to employ is Historically, uh, the choices for vector bundles have been made very difficult by the fact that I have to solve these very complex PDEs. Uh, as we'll see, solving this one in particular is very nasty, and although we can relate it uh, to various topics in algebraic geometry, which make this somewhat easier, this has been a real limitation in being able to build heterotic models with actually solving this equation. So I'm going to present a, a class of solutions that are much easier, which will provide a probe into the more general moduli space uh, and hopefully give us some insight into how to produce things with standard model spectra uh, in a heterotic background. And for the bulk of the talk, I'm going to be talking about moduli stabilization, or perhaps better phrased as moduli identification, how to really understand the moduli of the theory uh, and choose geometries that have fewer of them, would be one way to say this. So the idea here will be to choose a hidden sector bundle V2, which is in some sense more complicated. Uh, this is going to involve the other half of the Hermitian Yang Mills equations, uh, this is what's called the holomorphic condition. And this is going to constrain moduli in a non-trivial way. Uh, I should just point out that even in addition to just the problem of having lots of massless singlets in the theory, you really want to understand these moduli explicitly because they appear, uh, their values appear in Yukawa couplings, gauge couplings, et cetera. So if you want to understand the 4D theory, you really have to understand what values these, these moduli take. Uh, and this will be possible by choosing vector bundles which are in some sense rigid uh, under this, this uh, deformation theory associated to holomorphy. And they will be holomorphic only at special points. So this is the, the general base plan. And we're going to get started by thinking about how to choose simple uh, geometries to get things that look like standard model-like effective field theories in four dimensions. So the key observation is, uh, historically in the heterotic literature, when people have chosen vector bundles, they've chosen fairly complicated non-abelian vector bundles. For example, uh, this work started out choosing the tangent bundle to the calabi manifold itself uh, to produce an E6 gut theory. And from then on, various extensions at higher rank uh, have taken very complicated vector bundles over the calabi -L. However, it is a general observation that for most vector bundles, at some special loci in their moduli space, the bundle structure groups can and often do split or become reduced. Uh, this causes the low energy gauge symmetry in four dimensions to enhance. So just to give an SU5 example, I could imagine that my generic SU5 structure group could decompose into something that looks like U4 times U1. Geometrically, that would say that my vector bundle could be written as a direct sum of some rank 4 piece plus a line bundle, something that encoded that abelian uh, gauge factor. When that happens, the commutant within side E8 is going to enhance because U1s would be self-commuting. So I would have an extra U1 in the theory. I could consider, for example, the extreme case of maximal splitting. Suppose that my SU5 decomposed just into a sum of five line bundles, which would give me four extra enhanced U1s, uh, four, not five, subject to one overall trace condition that I still have, I live inside SU5. Now, why would I want to do something like this? The answer is that if I consider such a very simple uh, vector bundle, the simplest possible vector bundle, really, something that is completely abelian, it is going to be much easier to handle all the equations that I have to satisfy and to work out the effective theory from this heterotic geometry. Uh, specifically, the Hermitian-Yang-Mills equations, which I just introduced, become almost trivial to solve. 
The other reason that this is an interesting thing to do is that this bundle, which I have now broken into the minimal possible uh, abelian components, will still reside inside a larger uh, non-abelian bundle moduli space, and they'll still carry many properties of that generic space. So from the effective field theory point of view, you'll be able to probe into a much more generic class of bundles from this special starting point. I should mention that I, I pointed out here that in the effective theory, I'm guess getting extra U1s. Uh, these U1s generically are all Green-Schwartz anomalous and hence massive, uh, and most matter will become charged under them. Uh, and Hell mentioned this, this type of uh, U1 briefly this morning. Uh, so most of these U1s will be invisible to the low-D physics. However, uh, the discrete global remnants of these U1s, which are spontaneously broken, can still matter in terms of constraining the effective theory uh, and has various analogs with F theory, as Anhel mentioned. So we took this very simple uh, type of geometry and we tried to see, could we produce MSSM, or more appropriately, N MSSM spectra? Uh, we scanned over about a billion models. Uh, these were different choices of holomorphic vector bundles, over 65 different Calabia threefolds, all with relatively low Hodge number, uh, H11 less than equal to five. The point of this slide is going to be that if you want to engineer geometry that uh, does interesting 4D physics, uh, it would be great if you just knew what to write down at first pass. But you can see very rapidly how difficult this is to get it right, and also uh, how fast you run out of models uh, when you start to impose very basic constraints. So we started with 10 to the 12 uh, models. Of these, we found about 2,000 with the exact MSSM spectrum. This is the exact charge spectrum of the NSSM, also involving singlets and no charged exotics of any kind. It turned out that we could group these into about 407 families with distinct symmetries, uh, so distinct patterns uh, in their effective theory. As I mentioned before, the discrete remnants of these anomalous U1s will constrain the superpotential and the Kähler potential in a way that's actually quite useful computationally, uh, or perhaps dangerous depending on the model. Uh, you have a lot of, of control over the effective theory that you wouldn't otherwise have from this simple geometry. And of these, for example, 2,000 uh, standard models grouped into 400 families. Just to give you the point of why you need to do this on a large scale, if you start imposing uh, not just the massless spectrum, but even sort of preliminary uh, extra criteria. For example, you want no dimension 4 or 5 proton decay. This immediately drops your 407 families down to 198. If you want a non-trivial uh, uptype Yukawa matrix, you're down to 45. There's still a non-trivial intersection between these two of order about 20. Uh, but as you start imposing more and more criteria, you're running out of models very rapidly. So you go from a billion down to zero very quickly. So the goal of this program, which is ongoing, is to try and understand, uh, use this as a probe for what types of heterotic geometries can really produce uh, standard model physics of interest. And hopefully not just create a big database, uh, but to really understand from a more top-down point of view what the things of interest are and what their properties are. So this work is ongoing. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears now and move to uh, the fact that if you build something that looks like the standard model, of course you still, this is a supersymmetric vacuum as I've described it so far, uh, you really still have to deal with the problem of moduli and ultimately supersymmetry breaking. So let me turn to uh, the work that we've been trying to do on moduli stabilization. This is going to involve the other half of the Hermitian yang mills equations. So I, I rather um, blithely at the beginning gave you a list of moduli of the theory, the Kähler moduli, the complex structure moduli, and the bundle moduli. And I, I behaved on that first slide as if they were separate. But as we'll see, the, actually the equations of motion link these moduli in very non-trivial ways and produce constraints that you really have to take into account in the perturbative theory. Now the goal of this work was to use the perturbative theory for as much as it's worth. Uh, eventually you'll have to consider non-perturbative effects that are much less understood. So let's really try and probe what the perturbative theory is giving to us. So the first thing it's saying is that for supersymmetry, I must have a holomorphic vector bundle. The 0, 2, and 2, 0 parts of my field strength have to vanish. Now, it's very easy to work out uh, in 10D. You can see very rapidly that this holomorphic condition is going to give you a contribution to your 4D potential. In 10D, I've written just a piece of the 10D effective theory, uh, which, as you can see, depends on no four-dimensional derivatives. Uh, and so when I dimensionally reduce this, will be some part of the scalar potential in four dimensions. It's clear that this is a positive, positive semi-definite uh, terms, and when this equation is satisfied, this potential will vanish, and when it's not, in general, I will have some contribution to the potential. Uh, it has been well known, and I think Anhel mentioned this this morning as well, uh, that in general, this half of the Hermitian-Yang-Mills equation should appear as an F-term constraint in the 4D theory. 
uh, holomorphic abstractions. You can see this happening through the Gukov buffer witness superpotential, uh, where in particular you have a piece uh, of your three form H, which is built out of omega 3 Yang Mills. Here A is the, the gauge connection on my vector bundle. So I know that in general I will have some contribution to the potential from whether or not I satisfy this equation. Uh, I know this will be an F term in the effective theory, but how do I actually compute the solution and how do I really use this uh, in a practical way? So the first pass is let's assume that we start with the solution to the equation in consideration. And I'm doing this at a fixed complex structure of my base manifold. That means that I know for certain what I mean by barred and unbarred coordinates on the Calabio. So I'm just going to hold the complex structure fixed. Now I can ask what happens as we vary the definition of complex structure then? Must a bundle stay holomorphic for any variation in H21? So as I change what I mean by complex coordinates, does that component of the field strength have to stay zero? The answer in general is no. And to first order, uh, this is a very simple problem in deformation theory to write out what the condition is. In general, as you vary what you mean by complex coordinates, what used to be a 1, 1 part of your field strength can get rotated into the 0, 2 direction. And in addition, you can have fluctuations A of your gauge connection, which are not D-bar closed. So to first order, you have a non-trivial condition of this type that you have to satisfy. So what I really want to ask now is in the presence, at least of first order, of a, uh, of a deformation problem such as this one, uh, what are the actual moduli? Which fluctuations, simultaneous fluctuations, of my complex structure of my base manifold X and of my connection on my vector bundle will keep this equation zero? Now, I had said on the first slide that the moduli of the theory were H11, H21, and in general, the bundle moduli associated to each of my E8 bundles, but it's not going to be that simple. So the physics idea is to try and use this equation to constrain the complex structure moduli of the Calabi-L threefold, which historically have been one of the more difficult moduli to constrain perturbatively in heterotic. Uh, and the math question will be, given a calabi -L, how do I generate bundles which will create a non-trivial obstruction of this, time, of this type, uh, things that are holomorphic only at special, ideally isolated points in complex structure moduli space? Now, fortunately, in terms of solving this differential equation, we might worry that, in general, this depends on, for example, the 1-1 one -one part of the field strength of the vector bundle, which I don't know explicitly, just like I don't know the calabi metric. But there is some nice mathematics dating from the 1950s due to ITIA that helps us out. Specifically, in the 1950s, ITIA studied the simultaneous deformation space of a holomorphic vector bundle and its complex base manifold X. He said that just like H1 of Tx measures the holomorphic deformations of the calabi itself, that's H21, there is a different cohomology, uh, which I'm going to call here H1q, which measures the infinitesimal tangent space to the total space of my bundle and my base manifold. Atia said that you could describe this cohomology in terms of a short exact sequence as a non-trivial mixing of the endomorphisms of your bundle with the tangent bundle to the calabi -L. For anyone who hasn't seen a short exact sequence before, the, the takeaway message is that if you have something connected by arrows of this type, the first guy lives inside the middle guy, and the end guy is whatever is left over. The long exact sequence in cohomology associated to this sequence determines what these moduli are infinitesimally. So the moduli that preserve uh, the holomorphy of this total bundle are going to be broken down into two parts, the first of which is the familiar vector bundle moduli. The, uh, closed delta A, uh, D-bar closed delta A, uh, that preserve F02 uh, vanishing. But it will not, in general, be all of the complex structure moduli of the base and only a subpiece of them. Specifically, there's a non-trivial condition, namely the kernel of this map alpha, which takes H1, 2x into H2 and B, uh, where alpha here is just the class of the 1, 1 part of the field strength, called the Atiyah class. So, what Atiyah said is that the complex structure moduli of the base manifold that actually pertain uh, to this deformation problem are not all of them. They have to satisfy a certain contraction. So here, alpha is my map. Delta Z is a piece of complex structure. In order to be in the kernel, I have to have this be 0, but 0 inside cohomology. And if you rewrite that uh, in terms of mathematics, you reproduce exactly the fluctuation equation that I just gave you on the last slide. So you are indeed, if you can compute the Atiyah uh, the Atiyah class and the kernel of this map, you've computed the infinitesimal fluctuation problem that you really wanted to solve. So let's do this in the context of an example uh, and see how this actually happens. You could start very simple. You could say, if I take a single abelian gauge field, could that interact non-trivially with the moduli of the base? The answer there is no. All line bundles deform with the base. But the next simplest thing that you could write down 
uh, is, for example, a non-trivial extension of two line bundles. Again, this means that L is a subbundle of V, L dual is whatever is left over. This produces a non-trivial and stable SU2 bundle. Uh, in principle, such a bundle can actually stabilize arbitrarily many complex structure moduli of its base. So let me give you a, a specific example. This particular line bundle, where the integers here inside this O notation denote the first term class of that line bundle, uh, I'm giving this on a non-trivial Labiao defined as a single degree 2222 hypersurface inside a product of P1s. Now, why did I pick this one? Uh, this is one of the simplest examples I can write down. And you can see right away that this thing is going to depend non-trivially on the complex structure of its base. Because in order to define this short exact sequence, it turns out that this extension of two line bundles can only be non-trivial in the presence of a certain line bundle valued cohomology being non-zero. So there is what's called an extension class, which determines the non-trivial mixing of L and L dual uh, inside this cohomology. And I chose this example because this cohomology vanishes generically. So what I'm saying is that for this example, it is generically impossible to write down the bundle that I've chosen. However, cohomology, it is well known, can jump at higher codimensional loci in the complex structure moduli space of the base manifold. So this is an easy example of the structural complex structure dependence of a given holomorphic bundle. There are many others uh, that we've explored in the literature. Uh, you can do this with monad constructions of vector bundles, spectral covers, the seer construction, et cetera. But this is one of the very simplest examples. So I know from by construction that this bundle will depend non-trivially on the complex structure of its base. And now I have an equivalent, I have a, a different question I can ask, which is instead of trying to solve the Atiyah deformation problem, can I just ask where the non-trivial extension classes are zero or non-zero uh, on the complex structure moduli of the base space? It isn't obvious that this is the same mathematical question, but in work that came out uh, last autumn, we proved that this was in fact equivalent for this class of examples. So the question I now want to ask is, suppose that the cohomology I need, the real crutch I need to define this bundle, is non-zero at some starting point in complex structure moduli space. I want to ask what variations will preserve a non-trivial set of ingredients to build my bundle with, and which ones uh, will kill it. So in field theory, if you're asking about a jumping cohomology, this is actually very easy uh, from a physics point of view to understand what's going on. If you're talking about a cohomology being there and not being there for various values of the complex structure, what that means in field theory is that you have a mass term, generically. So let me call the fields that I'm interested in uh, and their duals, C plus and C minus. What this means in the effective theory is that there's a superpotential term which has a complex structure moduli dependent mass term. Uh, and when this prefactor, which is complex structure moduli dependent, vanishes, these are zero modes, i.e. the cohomology is non-zero. And when I fluctuate the complex structure such that this prefactor does not vanish, then you can show very simply in the effective theory that you grow a non-trivial obstruction. Okay. So, so far so good. We've seen that we can get, use bundle holomorphy in order to constrain the complex structure moduli at the base. But so far, everything I've told you involves infinitesimal fluctuation, either from a mathematical or an effective field theory point of view, around a point in complex structure moduli space. And this is a big limitation. You have to know where you want to start. And it, ideally, I'd like to find isolated solutions. I'd like to find isolated points in complex structure moduli space, where for only that one value is the bundle holomorphic. Now, this is hard just from a deformation theory point of view. However, when you phrase it in terms of a cohomology jumping problem, or for example, the non-trivial F term that you would get from the superpotential I just wrote down, we realize that this is actually possible to represent the complex structure loci, the vacuum solutions to the F terms, as an algebraic variety. Now, I don't have time to discuss here, but there's actually a pretty sophisticated uh, toolkit in computational algebraic geometry for analyzing the full space of solutions to an equation of this type, and in fact, it's possible to scan over all possible starting points. So just briefly, you could do that for the bundle that I just gave you. Uh, in order to make the answer manageable and discussable in a couple of slides, uh, I'm going to quotient this manifold by a Z2 times Z4 freely acting symmetry so that I reduce the number of moduli uh, and have less to talk about. But for this example, for the very simple jumping line bundle cohomology that I introduced, you get 27 distinct loci in complex structure moduli space where you have distinct jumping behavior or distinct holomorphic conditions for this bundle. The branches of the solution space range in dimension from seven to zero. Uh, so isolated point-like solutions would be zero dimensional in the solution space, uh, up to seven dimensions out of my original 68. Having found these isolated point-like solutions, we might think that we're all set. However, 
uh, an important point is that for given values of the complex structure, we still have to check transversality of the underlying labial. So if by any mechanism, uh, vector bundles, flux, whatever, if you're fixing yourself to very particular points in complex structure moduli space, you want to know whether the underlying labial is still smooth at that special point. Uh, generically, you know that a complete intersection Calabiao, a CC of the type that I wrote down, uh, is smooth for generic values of its complex structure by Bertini's theorem. But once we move to these special points, we really have to worry about singularities. So what happens for the example I gave you? We have this range of possible solutions, 27 different components. And as it turns out, almost all of them induce singularities in the base manifold. So for example, my nice isolated point-like solutions induce quite bad singularities. This dimension two singularity means that the Calabiao is going singular over an entire divisor. Here zero means singular over isolated points. Uh, and only one of those loci, which leaves four complex structure moduli unfixed, is actually smooth. So I'm going to do this very briefly so that I can get everybody off uh, to the castle exploration. But an interesting question you can now ask at this point is can I do anything with these singular solutions? Can I learn anything from resolving them uh, about the structure of the Calabiao's that I'm interested in? So it turns out, and I'll just give you the punchline here, that you can indeed resolve some of these singular geometries that you're led to through this moduli fixing. Uh, and in fact, some of them take a very explicit form that you're familiar with. These are conifold transitions. So you are led naturally by imposing uh, an isolated holomorphic vector bundle that is rigid in its holomorphy definition, uh, deformations. You can be led to special points in the Calabiao, which are singular and can be resolved and lead you nicely to new Calabiaos, which you know something about. So in the case where you can blow up these singularities as a conifold, uh, topologically that's a cone over S3 times S2, where the polynomial factors in a very explicit way, you can track everything you want to know about the theory, divisors, extension bundles, and symmetries, through this geometric transition. So for the manifold that I wrote down, starting with this particular Calabiao with Hodge numbers 4 and 68, uh, you can resolve it to produce a new Calabiao. This thing has Hodge numbers 19, 19. And indeed, you can actually do the, the complex structure stabilizing uh, analysis that I just described on either side of this geometric transition. And you find that it goes through exactly as expected. You get a singular locus on this side, which is smoothly blown up on this one. So you can repeat the branch analysis. Uh, I won't go through this. But the reason that this is important from this broader algorithmic viewpoint is that you know that, for example, for manifolds that can be described as complete intersection hypersurfaces in projective spaces, like the ones I just wrote down, all of these manifolds are, in fact, connected by such geometric transitions. Uh, Reed's fantasy hypothesizes that perhaps all Calabiao threefolds are connected by geometric transitions of this type. So it's a natural question to ask, if I've gone to all the work of engineering a bundle which will fix complex structure moduli for one manifold, can I learn anything about bundles that will fix complex structure moduli for other manifolds? And the answer that we seem to be seeing is yes. I should point out here that this is not a dynamical transition, as I've described it. Um, I don't understand how to control all the light states and the effective heterotic theory that happens through this transition. But I can use the mathematical uh, data on either side to, starting with a computation on one manifold, learn quite a lot about what will stabilize the complex structure moduli on the other side. Uh, I'm going to mention more in just a second that, in fact, you can learn many things uh, about various webs of Calabiaos connected by geometric transitions, also uh, from the model building that I described. So we're seeing some very interesting patterns uh, in the types of standard models that appear on Calabiaos that are connected by geometric transitions. So with that, let me conclude. What have we learned from this exercise? Uh, the first is that it's possible to build phenomenologically relevant heterotic models using the very simplest possible gauge configurations, sums of line bundles. This is a com computationally accessible arena for probing uh, more general geometries, and it allows us to push the effective field theory further than ever before uh, in a smooth heterotic compactification. Indeed, we can use the effective theory uh, to ways to our advantage, in particular viewed as a hidden sector mechanism. We can choose inside uh, the hidden sector E8 a holomorphic vector bundle which can constrain the complex structure moduli. Uh, this allows us, unlike introducing geometric flux, this allows us to keep the Kähler geometric model building toolkit uh, that we worked so hard for in step one. Uh, and we are, this is completely explicit. It allows us to determine the stabilized values which we need for physical couplings. Uh, as I mentioned only briefly, something that we're just beginning to look at in earnest, both of these tools give interesting hints into connections and patterns into the web of Calabiao threefolds connected via geometric transitions. You can learn things about complex structure fixing bundles uh, on each side of a resolution of the type I described. 
And in addition, we see very interesting patterns in the standard model data set that we've produced so far, which show repeated bundles uh, over various webs of Calabi owls that are connected by geometric transitions. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can I take just one question? I would, it's slightly surprising, perhaps, that you can avoid dimension four and five proton decay without having unwanted restrictions on the Yukawa couplings. Can you say anything about ah, that? Yes. So I should say that, um, indeed, the types of symmetries I've described are very restrictive on the Yukawas. So what tends to happen, you know that, for example, a U1 Petri Quinn symmetry is one of the only things available that will uh, forbid dimension four and five proton decay and keep all your Yukawas intact. For the examples that I mentioned, you're killing most of your downtype Yukawas, and you would have to re regrow those with non-perturbative effects. So at this moment, we just focused on you know, uptype Yukawas, preferably with a rank one, and then, indeed, you have to worry about dangerous textures uh, for the rest of it. <laughs>